Hello, 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 and welcome back to Final Fantasy XIII, A New Hope. Wait. We left off with Saz and Vanille leaving the Vile Peaks and Snow's uh, daydream of days past. We venture on into Chapter 5. I believe we made it. That'll slow down pursuit. But aren't there troops on this side? We can't relax just yet. Right. We press on. I'll take point. You watch our backs. Actually, why don't you let me take point? Can you handle it? It's not a question of can or can't. Now you're learning. Keep your eyes front. I'll watch the rear. Got it. All right, battle team has changed, and for the first time, Hope is the leader. Very first time that Hope's been leading. But first, the data log, of course. These entries that I've been skipping. We have Sid Reigns. Sid Reigns is the commander of the Wide Area Response Brigade a military unit otherwise known as the Cavalry. While lacking the sheer firepower of Psycom, the Cavalry is considered one of the most elite groups within the Guardian Corps. As a Brigadier General, <laughs> I actually think I'm not pronouncing that right, but whatever, in the Sanctum Army, Reigns should stand ready to repel the forces of Pulse. However, he seems to be seeking out the Fugitive of the Sea and taking them captive to some end that remains to be seen. I believe I mentioned that these entries actually update um, I don't know if it actually notifies you that these update. I don't think they've actually updated yet, but they do update. So hopefully we'll be able to see these update because they do expand upon character developments that are seen in the game. Day 7, Revelation. Sarah was overcome by curiosity when she saw the doors to the vestige wide open for the first time. She wandered inside and was branded by the Pulse Fell Sea. Unable to tell Lightning that she had become a Lassie, Sarah eventually revealed her painful secret to Snow four days later. Unwilling to see him suffer the same fate, the young woman tried to break off their relationship, but Snow chased after her and swore to help complete her focus, whatever it may be. We have locales. The Capra Whitewood. The Capra Whitewood is the border zone that separates the wilderness of the Vile Peaks from the civilization of Palampolum. Under the jurisdiction of the Sanctum Military, the Whitewood serves as an experimental facility for conducting research into bioweapons. The security of this classified area is built into its design. The paths winding through the trees are deliberately confusing, causing intruders to become hopelessly lost. And lastly, Cocoon Society. The Wide, A Wide Area Response Brigade. The Wide Area Response Brigade is a Guardian Corps unit commanded by Brigadier General Sid Rains. The brigade is more famous for its unofficial name, the Cavalry. A mobile unit without a designated jurisdiction, the Cavalry patrols the uninhabited expanses between cities, ready to respond to emergency situations at a moment's notice. For this purpose, the brigade commands a cruiser. 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 <laughs> Trying to say cruiser as in brigadier. Ugh. Cruiser class airship, the sole exception in the Guardian Corps. 
and the Lindblom. Due to the expansive area it patrols and the need for mobility, the Wide Area Response Brigade has no fixed base. The Lindblom is the command ship of the Brigade and serves as both home and headquarters for its soldiers. It is heavily armed and armored for a Guardian Corps craft, but is easily outclassed by the anti-pulse gunships built for the main SICOM fleet. Alright, reading is done. Now let's game. So, for Sterium here, we have some abilities that we do want to pick up with Hope. We have Thunder, Fyra, Water, and Fear Siphon. Fear Siphon slightly charges ATB gauge upon attacking staggered target. It is an auto ability. I don't remember if I talked about it last time, but it is an auto ability. When Hope attacks a staggered target in the Ravager role, uh, the ATB gauge will charge slightly, which will be very handy when we lack haste in this section. Actually, we haven't seen haste yet, so let me take that back. We haven't seen haste yet. Actually, I guess we technically have sort of seen the word haste. I guess Fortisol grants haste. So we have seen haste. We don't have haste in this section except through Fortisols. Uh, Synergist, uh, we have this bar fire ability. I guess we can pick that up since we can afford it. The only other ability is Quake over here, which I probably do want to grab, but I don't have enough a uh, CP for that. Lightning has two abilities left in Commando, one ability left in Ravager. So we have Launch and Ravage as a Commando. As a Ravager, I can get up there. There's Fire. I'm going to focus on Fire first. And I'm going to go back to Commando. We can get Launch. Launch, attack, and launch stagger target into the air. So, Launch is another auto ability. So now you can see that uh, Commando auto abilities, there's way more auto abilities than there are actual uh, individual abilities. And these auto abilities are very handy, especially once we have a bunch of these combined at once. Uh, so power chain attack uh, boosts the target chain gauge, or sorry, boosts the chain duration, uh, provided that the chain gauge is empty and helps to help future chaining. Life siphon when lightning kills a target, she regains one ATB segment. Fault siphon when attacking an enemy with status ailments, slightly recharges the ATB gauge. We will not be seeing this in this section because we lack debuffs. And launch. Attack and launch a, star a staggered target into the air. This is the, the auto ability that most people who play 13 remember. Because when you stagger an enemy, attack turns into launch. And launches the enemy into the air. And keeps them out of the way of being able to um, attack uh, your allies. Um, stagger normally, you know, you can normally when a, ta a target is staggered, you can interrupt them. But with launch, you can further launch them into the air and stop them from attacking for a while. But the manual abilities between Attack Blitz and Ruin, these are the choices that we have to make. These things take place automatically. We picked up her Fire, so now spell-wise she has Fire, Thunder, and Water, but strike-wise she only has Spark Strike and Aqua Strike. So if we face a fire-weak target, she will only be able to use spells against it, which will be important to note. Um, in a future section. Um, Hope has picked up Fear Siphon, of course. He also has picked up Fyra. And we can see here that Fire versus Fyra, Fyra takes more ATB segments than Fire does. It does do slightly more damage than Fire, but not enough for two Fires to be less damage than one single Fyra. But the advantage of Fyra is twofold. First, it um, does damage to targets in a range as opposed to fire, which is a single target spell. Fyra is AoE. So Fyra, like Blitz, attacks multiple targets and is then better to use when facing multiple targets, especially those that are weak to fire. But furthermore, against a staggered enemy, Fyra actually gets a special bonus, which I will hopefully be able to show off um, soon enough. So just to get rid of that exclamation point, Paradigms. These have actually reset yet again. Um, they reset in the middle of Chapter 4, but they also reset here at the start of Chapter 5. Thankfully, they will stick for the rest of the chapter, and I believe they will carry through into a later chapter. 
once we get these set up. So again, Hope has access to the Ravager Synergist and Medic rolls. Lightning has access to the Commando, Ravager, and Medic rolls for a total of nine possible paradigms. But I still don't feel like using Medic, so there's really only four paradigms to get set up. And again, I'm probably going to utilize two copies of Slash and Burn and two copies of Dual Casting. And I'll probably set up a Synergist paradigm in at least two capacities since we have the space for it that should carry us over for the chapter equipment wise um i still haven't gotten lightning's second accessory slot i guess that was something to focus on in that crystarium but i chose not to but hope does have two slots and so we can equip him with a bangle and we can also equip him with a doctor's code if we so wanted um, the Doctor's Code will, of course, heal us significantly better than a Medic will. Although at this point, with our HPs at 500 and 600, the Doctor's Code will only, quote-unquote, only heal Lightning for half HP. Which is still better than a Medic, but not as good as certainly Chapter 3. Uh, Lightning being the Commando probably would benefit most from either the Strength Boost or the Magic Boost. Since she has Blitz, the Strength Boost is actually a little better because her Blitz will be able to attack targets within a range. And now that she has four ATB segments, she can use Blitz twice in a single string, which can be very potent. Now, if I want to utilize the Magician's Mark, I could put it on Lightning, in which case she will focus on only the single target Ruins. Or I could put it on Hope, and since Hope has Fyra, this will be pretty effective if we're targeting multiple things with that Phyra. This of course depends on what enemies we're facing though, so for the time being I'm going to stick with this defensive plan. And if I encounter a fire weak target, I will try to exploit the Phyra for damage dealing. Um, I don't know if the shops updated, I think they did. They did. Unicorn Mart now sells antidotes, which removes poison from one ally. We've yet to actually see poison in this game, but this is sort of a hint that poison is probably going to come up in this section. Um, we don't have any antidotes right now, so it might be tempting to buy some, but I'm going to hold off on this. BNW Outfitters now sells a tungsten bangle, which is a better version of the silver bangle, increasing HP by 150 instead of 100. I'm again going to hold off on getting that. We also get uh, two different types of accessories here. Metal Armband and Serenity Sachet, or Sachet, I'm not actually sure what it's supposed to be pronounced as. Uh, these actually provide debuff resistance. Metal Armband resists D-Protect by 30% and Serenity Sachet resists D-Shell by 30%. Uh, those percentages aren't actually too good and they're not really worth investing in, especially because they're 3,000 gil. But furthermore, you'll actually be able to pick up these accessories. I'm actually not sure about the Serenity Sachet, but Metal Armband is frequently found in chests. And obnoxiously so. I think there's probably like seven to eight Metal Armbands over the course of the game. Um, if you do want to use these, they're actually pretty cheap to upgrade, and when they upgrade, they're more effective. Um, these base versions of the accessories, I believe, cap out at 45%. If you upgrade them to their next tier, they will be able, they'll be able to go up to 60%, but even then, they're still not really worth doing. It's not worth wasting an accessory slot on debuff resistance. And we have Lenora's Grudge, which I believe actually... Uh, we've seen this before, I just never opened up the shop. So, nothing new actually there. Now for some action. There's some new enemies. I can do this. These are frag leeches. They lack any elemental weakness, so we don't really want to utilize Fyra for damage dealing. But we can utilize Blitz. And here we can see the difference between auto chain and auto and a uh, manual abilities because auto chain wants to select single target spells but notice that lightning is blitzing meaning that she's attacking more than one thing it might be more effective for us to exploit multiple 
target damage with the blitz by also using multiple target chaining. So I'm just going to use Phyra's. The fight ends quickly nonetheless because of Lightning's strength boost. But uh, you don't really want to rely on auto chain so much if you want to utilize those area of effect abilities. Here we have more frag leeches. Managed to get a preempt on them. They also have a Thextron in the group, which we saw in the previous chapter. The Thextron is still weak to ice and lightning, but I'm going to stick with Pyra. There's the launch, but there's an annoying effect here where Lightning chose to use a single target attack instead of, of blitzing. That's because Commando AI tends to focus on single target attacks against a, sta a single staggered enemy, or rather, a staggered enemy in general, instead of using Blitz. So in that situation, it might be better off waiting for Lightning to start Blitzing before commencing with the Phyra. He did not get the preempt here. Um... These guys are weak to thunder, so we could try to exploit lightning's spark strike, but we'll see something weird happen, though, if we try to go that route. This work better, light? She's alternating between spark strike and thunder, and that's because Ravager AI loves to alternate abilities, because alternating abilities does allow for a better chain increase per ATB segment. But it doesn't allow for a better ATB or a better chain increase per second, which is generally more important. So Ravager AI tends to not exploit elemental weaknesses in the ways that you would want to. Have you ever been here before? On duty, I mean. No, I haven't. This area is covered by the Woodlands Observation Battalion. You scared? Uh. Not really. I'm ready to fight if I have to. To keep you safe. Uh. I'll want it back. Lightning. I'm glad I followed you. By myself, I would have had no chance. The data log updated already. The Woodlands Observation Battalion. This unit is part of the Guardian Corps, but unlike the Bodum Security Regiment, the Woodlands Observation Battalion patrols non-residential areas. Its main duty is to prevent wild creatures from encroaching on suburban districts. The battalion also provides the bulk of security personnel for the Gapper Whitewood Bioweapon Research Facility, despite the facility's status as a SCICOM run initiative. Oops. That's our new enemy. Items. Time to move. Alright. So, a little mention about Hope Come. as a leader. Uh, he operates a little differently than most other characters. It's kind of hard to tell. But he actually runs slightly slower than the rest of the party. Everyone runs at the same speed, except for Hope, who runs at 93% speed. Presumably this is because he's a kid, as opposed to a full adult, which I guess means that he runs slower than the rest. But if you do want to try to bypass various enemy encounters, like I don't feel like fighting these two Thextrons, so I'm just going to run past them, you're going to have to know that, like, that Hope runs slower, and therefore it's a little harder to be able to pull off certain dodging. I managed to pull it off with ease, but... Sometimes it's very difficult. Ha! 
So we saw that Lightning chose to use Spark Strike and Thunder instead of single Spark Strikes. Uh, so I'm going to stick with her as a commando. She managed to decide to use Blift in that fight, which is nice. It can help expediate things if she hits more than one thing. Especially because we're not really trying to stagger, we're just trying to kill. Because they are weak enough relative to Lightning's strength. I got the preemptive strike on these frag leeches this time. So I'm going to try to wait and for what try to wait for lightning to choose to blitz first. But she didn't try to blitz. So instead I'm going to stagger all the things. Notice how short the stagger duration is because we we staggered pretty early into the preempt, meaning that it's not a max length max length stagger. I don't know if I've discussed max length, but uh, chain duration is capped at 30 seconds. Staggers are capped at 45 seconds. The length of the stagger depends on what the length of the chain duration is at the moment that you stagger. When you get a preemptive strike, 10 seconds is added to the chain gauges. If you stagger at that point, you'll end up with about a 28 second stagger, actually a little less because of the time spent waiting for the stagger. But... If you wait for some commando action, you can get a longer stagger. Just another battle. The military uses this place for bioweapons research. Lots of angry teeth and claws. Almost got the preempt. There's a new enemy in this section, or in this group, the Vespid. Vespids lack any elemental weaknesses. But they are, they do have more HP than the Frag Leeches, so I'm gonna try to take the Frag Leeches out first, despite how my moment of Libra forced Lightning to focus on the Vespid soldier. Would this work better, Life? Notice that the Vespid Soldier has started looking like what's charging up, and now he's using a Flurry of Fire. That did a significant amount of damage. Should probably heal up. Alright, I'm done healing. That's the power of using potions, as opposed to using medics, because if I had to heal with medics, I would have had to shift to a different paradigm, heal up, and then resume fighting after that paradigm shift, wasting valuable seconds. That'll help you form a strategy. So the Vespid soldiers do end up charging up and unleashing a flurry of fires if we let them go off. Now he expertly managed to utilize Blitz in that fight to take out those three enemies pretty fast, getting us a score over 17,000. 13,000 is the threshold for five stars, so being comfortably over 13,000 means you're doing very well. Let's see if we can get Lightning's Blitz. Yep, there we go. And now, thanks to her blitz there, we managed to stagger the enemy before the blitzes went off. Which meant that she managed to get AoE uh, on staggered targets. Which, as I said, you can't usually get the AI to do, but you can exploit the timing of stagger to, to accomplish that. This here's a behemoth. Seems like he's a new enemy. But he's actually not. 
It's an alpha behemoth, and we already have intel on him because we saw him in chapter three. It says magical attacks are ineffectual. That's actually a bit of an exaggeration. It, he does have magic, but generally when you see that later on, it's because they are immune to magic. Ineffectual implies that it has no effect, but it actually does. He delivers devastating physical attacks, which might prompt you to want to utilize Protect. Show what I made of. Let's see what we can do. We're using Lightning's Ravager, but notice that she's alternating between Fire and Aqua Strike. That's because the two weaknesses that Lightning can utilize are fire and water. And so she wants to alternate between fire elemental and water elemental abilities, but she doesn't have flame strikes, so her default there is fire, but she does have aqua strike, so she wants to use aqua strike. But this still puts us in an annoying pattern where she's alternating magical and physical, which is generally not as, as effective, especially when the target halves magic. So, no real way to fix that for the time being. And here we have three antidotes. So I didn't need to purchase those antidotes because they appeared in a chest. What is it? We need to hide. seem like they're even looking for us. I mean, we're let's see and we're on the loose. Psycom's keeping it all under wraps. They don't want their failure publicized. Better to lose us than lose their pride. So the other soldiers don't know about us, right? Right. They don't know anything about any fugitives. They log updated. This time, just with the story events. So... I think we can get this now. We've learned Lightning's Ravage. Bolster Blitz or Ruinga at head of attack queue when Ravager is present. This is yet another auto ability to add on to the list of commando auto abilities. Ravage is one that makes Blitz or Ruinga, which we've yet to actually see Ruinga, but makes those attacks stronger, at least the first in an attack queue, when there's a Ravager in the paradigm. So this is immediately going to be useful because we already have paradigms with Ravagers and commandos put together. And now we have Quake with Hope. Deal Earth damage to targets in a wide radius and extend their chain bonuses. You might think that this is a Ravager ability because we saw it in the Ravager tree, but if you look over here, there's no Quake. Quake is in fact a technique, and it is the first new technique other than Summon, I guess, um, which we saw in the Summon tutorial. Uh, it's a technique, it costs one TP, so you might wonder why we would want to use it when it costs TP and it takes valuable TP away from Libra and Summon. Well, it deals Earth damage to targets in a wide radius, meaning that it hits everyone, and it extends their chain bonuses. In fact, it greatly extends chain durations. Quake adds 26.67 seconds to chain duration. 26 seconds. Remember when I said that chain duration is capped at 30 seconds? Quake adds 26 seconds, effectively maxing chain duration on all enemies. 
So why would we want to use Quake when we have a Commando that can also boost chain durations, and significantly so? Well, one primary use for Quake is actually in a preemptive strike. Because in a preemptive strike, enemies start with 10 seconds of chain duration. If you stagger an enemy at that point, they'll have 28 seconds of chain duration, or of stagger duration. Stagger duration is capped at 45, so you only get half as long of a stagger. In fact, that goes down dramatically. Uh, if you t if you spend four seconds waiting to stagger an enemy, they're down to six seconds. When staggered, they'll have 20 seconds of stagger duration, which is even less. But if you get a preemptive strike, you open with Quake, and then you stagger everything, all targets will have 45 seconds of stagger that you can then choose to exploit to your heart's desire. Over here. So hopefully we'll be able to see that in action. I will note first though, if you take a look at the technical technical points in the lower right, not all bars are equal length. The first segment on the very left is pretty short. The second segment just to the right of it is about twice as long. And the segment to the right of that, and the three segments actually to the right of that, are significantly longer. Uh, it turns out that the first two TP are the easiest to regain, and then the three afterwards take the longest to recharge. Uh, the length of the, of the bar does represent how long it takes to get it back. So, you shouldn't shy away from 1 TP abilities because you'll be able to get that 1 TP back. Especially if you're at 0 TP, you'll get that 1 TP back and you can then use the TP again. It does make using 3 TP abilities a bit harder though because that third bar does take quite a bit of time. But uh, this bar is set up to try to encourage people to use techniques. However, most people tend to shy away from them because they want to save them for emergencies, like typical RPG mentality. It's all or nothing. So he's ravaged there, as we saw, carries a different animation where she jumps up in the air to launch her blitz. That's it, Hope. Be ready for the next fight. It's kind of hard to tell, but Life Siphon triggered uh, in that fight, and significantly so, because she killed four things at once, which regained four ATB segments. When she has four ATB, which is like right now, um, She'll regain her 4 ATB and she'll be back at a full bar and can then commence with more attacks immediately. Which made that a faster fight. We have another Alpha Behemoth here. Maybe we should try something else. I'll try to show it off here, but I'm not sure that's going to work. Uh, Alpha Behemoth has zero chain resistance, meaning that the chain increase is exactly what the chain increase of that spell will be. A target with zero chain resistance is really rare. Um, most enemies later on in the game have about like 50 to 90 chain resistance. Um, Higher chain resistances mean that it's harder to chain and therefore harder to stagger. But a zero chain resistance means that it's very easy to stagger. Re just regardless of what the chain resistance is, when a target is staggered, their chain resistance drops to zero. I don't think it actually shows in the intel, but it does drop to zero at least for chaining purposes. Which is why generally once you have a target staggered, you want to continue chaining past the point of stagger in order to exploit higher percentages, and therefore better damage dealing throughout the entirety of Stagger. Anyway, this target has zero chain resistance, so we can actually see how individual spells increase the chain gauge. Uh, there are some additions that we can't account for. Like if I use Phyra, which I want to show off, 
Spyra is fire elemental, and Alpha Behemoth is weak to fire, so it's going to trigger what is called a conditional modifier, which will add a small percentage to the chain gauge in addition to the base amount. But hopefully we'll be able to see exactly what Fyra does. Uh, it took us from 215 to 234.7, uh, which is just under 20 percentage points of increase. Contrast that with two fires. Wait for the attack so I can do this. We go from 281 to 303, which increases it by 22 percentage points. So a single Fyra increased the chain gauge less than two fires did, which makes it seem that Fyra is less effective for chaining than fire is, ATB-wise and time-wise. And that is true, pre-stagger. Before we have this guy staggered, that is true. So hopefully lightning should stagger. And then she killed, so I couldn't show this off. But right now it seems that two fires are more efficient at chaining than a single Fyra. That actually changes after stagger. I'm going the wrong way. We have the Vespids again. I was going to use Fyra if Lightning Blitzed, but she didn't, so I'm just going to utilize Auto Chain. Because it doesn't really matter what spells we use, it sort of does matter. Because Arrow actually chains less effectively. So if you really wanted a most efficient A to B um, sequence, you would want to use something like Fire Blizzard Thunder. Speaking of the conditional modifiers, alternating abilities, regardless of what role you're in, does increase the chain gauge. Which is why Ravagers try to alternate abilities in order to help with chain increase. This chest has a Hawkeye, which is a hope weapon. An official amateur competition model uses basic AMP technology. It is a magic based weapon. As we can see, it's lowering strength by a significant amount, but increasing magic more than the Nerda or Airwing can do. So I'm going to go ahead and equip the Hawkeye. In fact, Hawkeye is Hope's best weapon. If you need to choose a single weapon to utilize, Hawkeye would be it. Not all characters have a single weapon that works best for them, but for Hope, he does have a single weapon that works best. That is, that's not to say that there is probably a uh, special situation where you wouldn't want to utilize a Hawkeye. Or not, uh, not a Hawkeye, rather. How about this, Light? Focus on the best bit because of his damage dealing potential. But if Lightning uses Ravage, no, he did, she didn't use it again. Oh, but we did get off of Fyra. Ravager AI will use Fyra if multiple targets have an active chain. Which is the case right now. Let 
We got a Fortisol from that fight. We've yet to get an Aegisol, which I said we could start getting in Chapter 4. But we do have 11 Fortisols and 5 Deceptisols. It's best to try to save these for exceptionally difficult encounters, or at the very least, bosses. And try not to use them on worthless fights just to use them. This fight has a behemoth along with two, um, I'm not gonna back down. Dexterons. So it's certainly going to be a bit of a marathon. So let's go ahead and get Protect. I don't need to get Shell because these guys do not use, um, magic spells and I don't need bar spells because they don't do elemental abilities How the others are doing. Saz and Vanille? Who knows? Even if they got away, they'll get caught eventually. Then they'll have to choose resist or surrender. Surrender? Huh. Do you think he's still alive? You mean Snow? <sighs> He's too stubborn to die. And that's his best quality. He's arrogant and chummy from the get-go. Thinks he's everybody's pal. Never liked him much. He leads around a bunch of kids. Gang called Nora. Where'd they get the name Nora? It's a stupid acronym. Their little code stands for no obligations, rules, or authority. Must be nice. It's irresponsible. Data log updated. Day two, opposition. Snow was overjoyed to meet the older sister of his beloved Sarah, but Lightning was far from impressed. She had never approved of him or his group's unsanctioned activities. As far as Lightning was concerned, Nora's actions, hunting down weak monsters and acting like heroes, were reckless and irresponsible. She wanted Snow to forget about dating her sister, but the young man just laughed away her demands. His flippant attitude did nothing but reinforce her original impression. So apparently day two is when Lightning and Snow first met. And day 13 is when they all got thrown in together uh, in the purge train. Or I guess Snow technically wasn't on the purge train, but they got involved with that anyway. Day two is the earliest day, but it's not day one. So what happened on day one that was so significant and started everything? We know that day 11 was a significant day because that was the day of the fireworks at Palumpolum. Day 12 was presumably when the purge was ordered. Day 13 is the purge. 
But what happened on day one? Hmm. Can we get Lightning's accessory slot? Oh, we were closer to it than I thought we were. We can get her accessory, so she can get an extra thing. A common mistake is to want to probably try to balance strength and magic to try to account for all situations. So you might think, I want to put a strength accessory and a magic accessory on Lightning so that she can use her strength in physical fights and can use her magic in magical fights without needing to swap out accessories. This is actually pretty terrible because as we've seen, Lightning uh, very easily in a Ravager role will try to alternate strikes and spells, which is pretty slow. And if you balance her strength and magic sp stats, she is even more likely to do so when given the opportunity. So you don't really want balanced stats. You want one stat to be significantly higher than the other. So with this Gladius and Power Wristband set up, we can have her strength be twice as high as her magic, which makes her more likely to use strikes when given the chance. If we want her to be magic spec, the best option right now is to put the Blaze Fire Saber with the Magician's Mark. It doesn't quite double her strength. Like, her magic is not double, it's more like 50% higher, but it is at least an attempt to boost it. For now, I'm going to stick with the strength setup. In the second slot, if I had another power wristband, I could equip it to further boost her strength. But since I lack that, uh, I might want to put something on for some other purpose. And if I put the black belt on there, we see that the synthesized ability Physical Wall 10 pops up. As we saw, the Physical Wall 5 reduces the first 5 points of physical damage. Physical Wall 10 would reduce the first 10 points, which is even more effective. You can get that with the Silver Bangle as well. Which I believe, since this is only 10% of physical resistance, the Silver Bangle actually wins out. So I'm gonna go with that. facility for turning wildlife into weapons civilians aren't allowed in here are they we'll have to be sure and tell them if we see any wildlife auto containment paddocks paddocks paddock mm. These open-air pens, designed to restrain experimental bioweapons, are equipped with electromagnetic containment fences linked to a site-wide biorhythmic bon monitoring system. Fences deactivate automatically when biorhythms for known high-risk species are no longer detected in their proximity. Basically, there are locks, and you have to beat the enemy to get past the lock. This just forces encounters in. I'm gonna get this preempt while I have the chance. So I'm going to show off Quake before I even use Libra. Now look how long that stagger is. The stagger gauge is slowing only slowly as opposed to pretty quickly when a normal preempt occurred. So in a preemptive strike, you might want to open up with Quake just to ensure max length staggers or general chain duration for most enemies if you can only stagger one at a time. Anyway, that is a new enemy, the Silver Lobo. We didn't get a chance to Libra it, but after having killed one, we do have partial intel. In fact, we see that these guys are weak to fire. Holding back. So if I further the intel gauge, that's their only weakness is fire. They're also capable of inflicting poison, so we might be seeing poison against these guys. Uh, 80 chain resistance, but a stagger point of 120%, which means that we should be able to stagger them pretty quickly if we need to. Let's see if we need to. This will stagger. 
So it takes about two and a half rounds to stagger, or two and a half rounds to kill, rather, if we go for a no stagger approach. If we go for a stagger approach, note that Lightning's using fire, because she doesn't have flame strike. But she did go through those fires pretty rapid fire. <laughs> no pun intended, I said that without thinking. She went through those rapid fire, rapid fires. Okay, I'm done. Those were intentional. Um, because she only had fire and not flame strike. And because these guys are weak to fire, this might be an opportunity to attempt for a magic spec setup. This way, when lightning casts fire, it does extra damage, and it is the stat that does damage, the magic rather, um, so it could be more effective. I got the preempt here, so here we can really show off the power of Quake. Yeah, lightning killed that really fast. I'm also going to try to show Fyra's effect. 310 became 336. That's an increase of 26 percentage points. Now remember, previously when I used Fyra, it only increased chain by about 19, whereas two fires did about 22. That was due to all the conditional modifiers, in fairness. Fyra post dagger, however, does 26, which is more than 22. So Fyra post dagger increases chain significantly more. Well, I guess not significantly, but it does increase chain more than single target spells. So after stagger, you really want to try to use some Fyra abilities. The in-game description of Fyra says that it does more damage after stagger, which is actually false. It does the same damage, same base damage rather. It does do increased damage by virtue of attacking a staggered target, but that's not what the meaning seems to be. Now this should kill faster? Yeah, we set that up correctly. Maybe we should try something else. Anytime you can exploit elemental weaknesses, especially in the early chapters, you should try to take advantage of it. Later on, we will find alternate ways to get elemental um, boosts. This is a new, new type of enemy. I'm actually going to utilize information that I know, <laughs> which is sort of cheating. Um, I'm going to put Lightning back into a Strength spec. I'm going to put Hope with a Magician's Mark. No holding back. I get a Preemptive Strike. I killed them pretty fast with blitzes and fires. So, these enemies, if we look at their intel right now, they are in fact weak to fire. So you might think that putting lightning with the magician's mark and letting her cast Fyra would be better, but you notice that I utilized Hope's Fyra in this instance. 
uh, because fire has AoE as opposed to fire, and so I can utilize Hope's Fyra to try to take advantage of the multiple fire weaknesses in the fights. Coupled with Lightning's Blitzes, we can make short work of these crawlers. Now, of course, we got the Preemptive Strike, which helped with that. But, um... It's an additional way to try to exploit elemental weaknesses. This chest has six antidotes, and so we're... We would be up to nine, except the previous fight actually dropped four antidotes for free. Wild animals can be even more violent and unpredictable than the trained to kill variety. Be careful. Got another preemptive strike. You could choose to open with Quake, but you saw that this fight ended quickly anyway. Now notice that I did an... Instead of waiting for Lightning's Blitz... I chose to stagger immediately, which was less effective because then Lightning chose to use single target attacks. So the timing of stagger is important in that case. I also got this preemptive strike. I think I will use Quake here because that Silver Lobo is significantly farther away than the Lobos. Or the crawlers. <sighs> Caged in like the animals. This is a new enemy. It's a behemoth, but it's a different type of behemoth. It's the feral behemoth. That's not Libra. He is weak to water. He has a stagger point of 120%, chain resistance of 90. <laughs> So we try want to try to keep this guy interrupted with partial strings, otherwise he can get an attack off. We've tripped the security alarm. The observation battalion will be coming. Let him come. This is a group of 10 crawlers. Her life siphon triggered there, she's going to start blitzing almost immediately. And then she's going to start blitzing almost immediately again. Or not even blitzing, because we're down to one. See how effective AoE is? We took down 10 crawlers in 19 seconds. Eating you. Okay, I can tell you're hung up on something. Is it the Lissy thing? It's snow, isn't it?
What happened with him? You wouldn't understand. You and I are partners, Hope. My mother was killed because of him. his fault. And he needs to pay for it. I'm not ready yet, but I will be soon. That's why I followed you. Snow dragged us all into this. You and me, your sister, Sarah, he's got to pay. I've got to be stronger. I'll take the lead. Lightning is back as our leader. And if you remembered how fast Hope was running. Hopefully you can see that lightning does in fact run a little bit faster. It is kind of hard to tell though, but she does run faster than hope. So because hope is no longer the leader, he doesn't need the doctor's code. Might be tempting to leave the magician's mark on him, but I'm going to take that off. He, of course, wants the bangle. And... Well, for lack of anything really better, we have the iron bangle, but I think I'm going to put the black belt on him. Lightning does want the doctor's code because she's the leader. So... I'm going to put that on. There seems to be a gate behind that. I'll never pull this off. Whatever that thing is. Oh look, it's guarded by these silver lobos. Since we're controlling lightning, we can do something that the AI didn't really want to utilize, which was blitz. will help make the fights a little faster. Also, since we're targeting the commando, we can choose to use AoE against staggered targets as needed. takes care of this gate. It was guarding a star pendant. Which increases poison resistance by 30%. Which, as I said, isn't really too useful. Unlike the other debuff resistances, at least poison resistance has an immediate use because we're fighting enemies that can inflict poison. But we don't really worry about poison too much. Probably even popped up, and I haven't really cared about it. Follow my lead. Out of my way. So 
far, so good. Let's pick up the pace. Could I use one of those? A bit too heavy for you. Okay. You became a lessee, so now you're gonna marry this idiot? And you think I'm gonna buy that? Full points for originality. But don't forget, if you really are a lessee, it's my job to deal with you. Sis. This is ridiculous. Worst birthday ever. <laughs> Wait, Sarah! Why won't you believe her? You kidding me? She gets made a lassie and you pop the question? Lightning, stop it! No, you stop it! Get out of my house. You're shutting her out! She's your sister! <sighs> Fine. I'll do it. I'll protect her. How practical. We interrupt this program to bring you an urgent sanctum bulletin. Late last night, officials confirmed the presence of a Pulse Thalsi inside the city of Bodom. Acting with Thalsi Eden's approval, authorities declared a state of emergency. The entire district will be quarantined in response to this crisis. This is a sanctum bulletin. Late last night, Officials confirmed the presence of a Pulse Thal C inside the city of Bodom. Acting with Thal Sarah, I should have listened to you. Aha! Day 12, celebration. On Lightning's birthday, Sarah revealed she had become a pulseless sea and had accepted Snow's proposal for marriage. Thinking her sister had made it all up, Lightning chased her from the room with harsh, biting words. By the time she realized Sarah was telling the truth, it was too late. Her sister had returned to the Vestige and become a prisoner of the Thal Sea. The only thing Sarah had left behind was Lightning's birthday present, a survival knife. Which she then gave to Hope. So this is certainly Lightning's motivation for boarding the Purge train. Um, because... Sarah, her sister, being the pulseless sea and therefore the enemy of Cocoon, was being exiled away. I mean, we already knew that, but that at least shows us what was the immediate um, cause for that. So these days are starting to get filled in.
it's a target. common misconception that the only way to deal damage in this game is to stagger. As we saw in that fight, we killed everything without even staggering. This here is a new enemy. The Barbed Spectre. It's another one of those fire-weak enemies. How much HP does he have? Over 9,000! Do we need to stagger him though? He already got about halfway through, so. Probably not. Keep up with me, Hope. enemy is guarding an edged carbine. It's a lightning weapon. This gun blade was developed as part of a project aimed at enhancing the magical abilities of Sanctum soldiers. As you can see, it boosts her magic a little bit. You can actually see what the individual stat boosts of the weapons are if you go into the inventory. The Edged Carbine gives 8 points of strength and 20 points of magic, as opposed to the Gladius, which provides 25 points of strength and 13 points of magic, and the Blazefire Saber, which provides 15 points of both strength and magic. So the Edged Carbine provides 5 more points of magic, but only half as much strength. Now these points aren't really too big, you might notice. Certainly relative to this accessory that we upgraded in the previous chapter that now provides 60 points of strength and 60 points of magic. But you might remember that their level 1 ver versions only provided 20. We had to upgrade them in order to get to the 60 amount. The same is true of weapons. When you upgrade weapons, uh, they provide more stats. And I think we probably even saw that in the when I was showing off upgrading in the Blazefire Saber. But... Certainly, weapon decisions matter a little more than accessory decisions because, you know, the power wristband affects any character who equips it, but the edged carbine only affects lightning, and therefore you have to be very careful with how you choose to upgrade a character's weapon, or which weapon to upgrade, rather. So another thing to point out about this barbed specter that we saw is that it seems similar in structure to a different enemy that we also saw in this chapter. Um, that was the Vespid. And you might have even noticed that it started glowing up in the middle of the fight like the Vespid did. Similar enemies behave similarly, I guess. The best, the, uh, not the best, but the Barbed Spectre also has a charged up attack. We didn't get to see it in that fight. But we see it in this one. Well, if we get the preempt, probably not. Lightning missed. Now note that Lightning does not have Quake, which is of course only Hope learned Quake, and so for these fights we won't be able to utilize Quake like it like we did previously when he got a preemptive strike. But we do have Lightning Summon, which we haven't used yet, other than the one time we did in the tutorial fight. On your toes. 
We're fighting another Feral Behemoth, but this time we're controlling Lightning. Which means that we can do something that we couldn't do in the previous fight, which was actually select Aqua Strike and only use Aqua Strike because he is weak to water. We can exploit that water weakness as well as do a significant amount of damage. These Aqua Strikes are doing about as much damage as a Commando Attack would do, but they come with the benefit of increasing chains, so it'd be better to stick with the Aqua Strikes here. Versus going back to the Commando roll. That Behemoth drops Magical Moments, which is actually a key item. An electronic pass granting access to the Magical Moments retail network. So... We seem to have a new shop. When we get to a safe point, we can see what that shop sells. Let me go look ahead. Which is right here, I guess. Okay. Magical moments. An, an enchanting charm to protect that special someone. Heirloom quality luxuries steeped in the powers of antiquity. All accessories legally crafted and certified free of Lassie magics. What do they sell? They sell Auric Amulet. Cast shell when HP is low, functions only once per battle. I don't remember if I called it out. Um, this is an alternate way of getting buffs. In this case, when your HP goes low, shell is cast automatically on your character. We already had one of those though. And it is expensive to purchase. Got the preempt on this guy. Gil. Now there's two other sets of encounters here. Let's get this over with. If you can't tell, preemptive strikes are very powerful to get. We have three barbed specters here, so this might be the moment we get to see the charge up attack. No, I guess not. Yeah. 
Uh oh. I don't want to fight this group. I don't want to. Get me out of here. Okay, fine. By focusing on the Alpha Behemoth and blitzing to take out the crawlers, that fight became a lot easier than trying to take them on one on one. Or one by one, I guess. Not one on one. Eight vials of fragrant oil. So here's a three way fight as we see by the fact that they're attacking each other. On your toes. The thing about three-way fights, in the previous fight, I used Blitz on the Feral Behemoth. To t and then, while I was Blitzing him, the minions got taken out. But notice that my Blitzes are not hitting anything else but the Feral Behemoth. This is a weird mechanic that only pops up in three-way fights. That Ravage should have certainly hit the Silver Lobos, but nothing did. All these guys, I guess except for this guy who got hit by Feral Behemoth Strike, did not get hit by a Blitz. Keep that in mind. This also affects Quake. If you use Quake in a three-way fight, it only affects the team that you're targeting and not all enemies. It's a really weird mechanic that only pops up in three-way fights. That wasn't so bad. I want to see what's over here. Oh, it's a barb specter. Oh, but the gate closed. Well, I guess it's a special barb specter. What? There's another exclamation point. Behemoth! So this charge up attack is called spin attack, but it actually missed, so we didn't see what it did. But it does seem to do physical damage, that's all we know. again. Well, that's the charge up attack. So yeah, there was a behemoth hiding behind here, and that was what that gate was for. This chest contains a watchman's amulet. 
Casts Veil when HP is low, functions only once per battle. You've yet to actually see the Veil ability. But Veil lowers, uh, or rather, it increases your resistance to debuffs. It increases it by 50%. Debuffs are half as likely to land on the party member that has Veil. Also works on enemies if they have Veil. So we have poison now. We saw poison in the previous fight, but we have poison now. And you can see what poison does. It ticks away at your HP. Which makes sense with how we've seen poison in past games. But it ticks away very slowly, and it's generally not worth worrying about. Just leave them like this. Don't touch anything. <clears throat> Control your emotions. If you want to survive, you forget about sympathy. <sighs> How can I explain? Think of it like a strategy. Hmm. Focus on your ultimate goal and shut out everything else. Still your mind. Move on instinct. <sighs> Let doubt take over, and despair will cripple you. <sighs> Strategy. Good. I'll take anything to help me get through this. Operation Nora. Nora? My mother's name. Your revenge? Yes. Don't tell me. I know getting revenge on him won't... bring her back. I know that! But Sarge won't cut it. Snow didn't kill your mother. The Sanctum did. Whose side are you on? The side of truth. Fine. I'll fight the Sanctum with you. I'll learn to survive. How can you judge someone else when you know that you're the same? Even I have dark secrets. Secrets I'd rather forget. Ah uh, yeah, these do update over time. Ope Estheim. Ope lives in the city of Palampolum. However, when he visits the town of Bodum with his mother, Nora, they are swept away by the chaos of the Purge. Nora dies in the ensuing violence, and Hope later becomes a pulseless sea. 
The boy blames Snow for his mother's death. Driven by his desire for revenge against the Nora leader and the Sanctum, Hope eagerly joins Lightning on her headlong charge into battle. And Nora this time. Nora is Hope's mother. Worried about the worsening relationship between her son and his father, Nora wonders how to break down the barriers Hope has created. Wanting to protect her boy from the horrors of the Purge, she volunteers to join the battle, but is killed during the chaotic conflict. Nora begs Snow to get Hope home, but the Nora leader Hope never hears the boy's name before she slips from his grasp. They have similar hairstyles, though. I mean... You have to sort of see that they have similar hair and then go, Oh, you must be the son of the person that died in my arms. Can we max out our Crystherium now? We have one strength, two magic, and one roll level. Whoops. That's the magic. There's the strength. What's the one I'm missing? Did I miss one? Ah, we missed this one forever ago. So now Lightning has gained a level as a commando. She is now a commando level 2. Which increases the damage dealt by commandos. Or by Lightning uh, in the commando world. She will do more damage. It's not too big of a boost. Um... It goes from 100% damage increase to 110% damage increase, I recall. Which means that she's basically doing 5% more damage as a commando. Let's see, Ravager. Uh, 1 HP, 2 Strength, 2 Magic. There's the 2 Strength. There's the 2 Magic and there's the HP. So we should be done once we get these. She gained a level as a Ravager, which means that she will chain slightly more effectively as a Ravager. And then Medic, we only have the 1 HP node. So now Lightning is maxed out in her Crystarium. There's nothing else to get here. Hope is missing a Strength and a Magic, which is right there. And he has gained a level as a Ravager, so he will chain more effectively. Synergist is missing one HP node, which is right there. He's gained a level as a Synergist, which means that his buffs he casts will last a little longer. Medic we have yet to touch entirely, because there's been no abilities. And he has gained a level as a medic, so he will heal more effectively as a medic, though we've been avoiding that. You've noticed that I didn't bother going into the Crystarium after each individual bot or each individual battle, even though there are these nodes that are sitting here, and that's because these stat increases are pretty inconsequential individually. Certainly in bulk, they do make a difference. We picked up a significant amount of HP for Hope, he's now up to 650. The magic boost isn't really so significant. He gained, what, 6, 9, 12, 15 magic. So he went from 83 to 98 magic. I mean, it is a bit of a boost, but it's less than a single Magician's Mark would equip, or would boost him by. But the world level is a bit more significant. Not the medic roll level because we haven't really been using it, but the Ravager will let us chain a little more effectively. The Commando World Level will let Lightning do more damage. You might say that Strength would also let Lightning do more damage, or Magic, but... Um, really, it's not really worth pursuing Crystarium after each individual fight unless you're looking for a particular ability. I prioritized abilities super early on. Once I got all the abilities, I stopped really paying attention to the Crystarium. I believe we've seen these guys before, and I outright lied to you, we've never seen these guys before. We have a core marksman and a core watchman. Let's get this over with. 
If I had to guess, the Marksman has lower HP than the Marksman. Or, uh, sorry, the Marksman has less HP than the Watchman, and that is true. 2,000 HP versus 6,000, because previous gunners tend to have lower HP. They are all weak to ice, but the Marksman is capable of bestowing in fire. Which doesn't really mean much. But the Watchman now, this Watchman now has in fire, which means that he does fire elemental abilities. I guess it also allows him to cast Mana Drive Fire. Although I guess this guy just used Mana Drive Fire, so I guess not. Um, but it does mean that we could cast Bar Fire to reduce their damage if we really wanted to. Or you could just end the fight faster. Best defense is a great offense, generally, in this game. This is a new enemy, I believe. The Milvis Velocycle. Uh, not weak to anything. 25,000 HP, level 6. Whatever that means, levels don't really correspond to strength amounts or damage amounts or general difficulty as much. It, it's more just the statistic that's used in calculations more than like an actual indicator of strength. 50 chain resistance, stagger point 220. So maybe we want to stagger this guy in order to deal with him most effectively. So alternating between strikes and spells, not really the way to go. I want to get more chain duration now. I don't want to use those spells. Alright, now that he's staggered, I'm going to chain a little more. His chain resistance is actually zero, so we're chaining higher than we were before. He's now at 450%. And I can kill in a single string of attacks now. Barely got five stars, actually. Got another... Collection of Watchmen and others. Kill the Watchmen first. Because he's weaker. We use AoE to take care of the Watchmen. should be able to win the fight before someone dies. And we did. So, one of the things that like you sort of have to realize as you play this game is that it's okay to be at red HP. Because your HP is restored in between fights anyway, you don't need to heal up in between fights anyway. You can end a fight at red HP, especially if you know that you're going to win. You can also stay in red HP for as long as you want. Although, you probably don't want to die. If you anticipate dying, you certainly don't want to die. We got an Aether Soul, which is actually a shroud that restores the party's TP. And as you can see, if I pull up the shroud menu, Aether Soul actually pulls up your TP gauge to show you what your current TP is. Aether Souls are very rare. They are not dropped by enemies. Fortisols and Deceptisols and Age of Souls can be, but Aether Souls can't be. And so, it's very difficult to obtain Aether Souls, even once the shops are fully um, released or updated, I guess. 
Uh, you can't purchase Ether Souls directly. The only way to get Ether Souls is through indirect means. So you don't really want to use Ether Souls uh, willy nilly. For this fight, I'm going to this show off a speedrun tactic because it works pretty well. We're actually going to utilize a summon in this fight. I'm going to skip this animation because we've seen it before. Now, summons are not easy win buttons or whatever like they were in previous games. You do have to do some work in order to use a summon effectively. But in this case, the effective use of the summon to get all enemies staggered and then use Zantetsuken. This kills all enemies and ends the fight. So, I don't know if I noted it. You can actually see summon from the status menu if you hover over lightning and press square. Um, you can actually see here more detailed information. His SP, which is a sort of version of strength. His ATB gauge, which you can't ever see directly, but it does affect his sequence of attacks. When he runs out of ATB, he then uses Alder's Shield to regain it back. His Strength and Magic stats. His Gestalt abilities. You can't actually see what they do, but they are there. Uh, Stormblade, Lightning Strike, Razor Gale, Thunder of Fall, and then Zantetsuken. Plus, you see that he's immune to Poison, Pain, Fog, Daze, and Death. Uh, Zantetsuken is a special ability that, um, like previous games, can invoke an instant kill, but it's not a chance mechanic in this game. It's actually a calculation based on the enemy's HP, Odin's strength, and the chain gauge of the target. It's a little different than attacks, where normally like you do a certain amount of damage based on your strength and the target's chain. Uh, in that this one looks at the chain gauge of the enemy and squares it, as opposed to looking at the chain gauge directly. And the square of the chain gauge increases relative to the chain gauge itself, which means that a chain of 500% becomes a factor of 25, versus a chain of 200%, which becomes a factor of 4. Zantetsuken is most effective against enemies with maxed chain gauges, which is 999.9%, in which case there's a factor of 100 uh, in the calculation for Zantetsuken's instant death effect. Now, it's pretty difficult to be able to get enemies to the Zantetsuken threshold, unless you're facing enemies with low HP, or enemies with low chain resistances, or otherwise you can chain them up pretty high. And as long as they have a low HP relative to the Zantetsuken threshold. In that, in that fight in particular, we can utilize Zantetsuken, and so summoning Odin does serve as a nice wipe of the battlefield. But it is situational, and you have to know how to use it and how to get Zantetsuken the trigger. All these mechanics that I've described are not noted anywhere in the data log, by the way. Uh, it's only really through a translation of the Ultimania that we even know how the mechanics work. Um, a casual player might assume that Zantetsuken is random and triggers very rarely, but it is controllable if you understand the mechanics of it. Basically, chain higher before you use Zantetsuken and lower the enemy's HP. You don't need to kill the enemy, of course, because if you're trying to trigger the instant kill, you probably don't need to kill the enemy. But uh, it, it, it is a uh, mechanic that is situational as opposed to chance-based. So we have these soldiers now. 
and the Milvis Vela cycle. I'm actually going to utilize a shroud in this fight. I'm going to use Fortisol. This is Aster Protoflorian, also known as um, Bulbasaur. I am going to utilize things in this fight. We Libra him. He has all elements. He's normal to strength and magic. He has 129,000 HP, which is pretty significant. Stagger point of 200%, chain resistance of 80. How are we going to deal with this guy? He's now using efflorescence, which did an amount of damage. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and get protected and shell. Shell actually affects that damage. He just used um, Exoproofing Ice, which, as you see, changed his vulnerabilities. He is now weak to fire, and he absorbs ice. So we don't want to use Blizzard spells anymore, but we do want to try to exploit fire, which we do have. However, I don't really want to be in this situation for various reasons. However, being ice elemental does make his attacks ice elemental. And so with Bar Frost, we can further reduce his damage. Now he's using Exoproofing exo Fire, which makes him opposite. He absorbs fire and he is weak to ice. So I'm really stalling here because I want to stagger him, but I want to stagger him with an elemental weakness that I can exploit. And because, because I don't have Flame strike with lightning, and she is currently strength spec'd. I can't really summon, or I can't really um, stagger right now to maximum potential. So I'm hoping for him to do a different exo proofing to be able to exploit that instead. Proofing lightning, I can exploit. So now he absorbs lightning and is weak to water. And you can also see down here employs powerful lightning based attacks, delivers devastating physical attacks, healed by lightning damage, vulnerable to water damage. I believe those last two notes are quite rare to actually see that the game would actually explicitly say healed by lightning damage when there's absorbed on the right. Vulnerable to water damage when he's weak to water. I find that interesting, but anyway. Uh, now we can go ahead and exploit his water weakness. By the way, if you wonder what haste does, it of course increases your ATB speed which you can see in this fight because my ATB gauge is now red, meaning that it regains faster.
And we managed to beat him, thankfully, because with Fortisol it made it faster. We also exploited elemental weaknesses and um, made that a fast fight. Fast in sort of air quotes, because 2 minutes 55 seconds is slow relative to the speedrun strats. But regardless, it is a faster fight than most people who play casually end up facing, because... Unless you know to exploit his elemental weaknesses and can spec your character as well, as well as perhaps using a Fortisol, um, this fight can take several staggers to complete. Especially if you don't exploit elemental weaknesses. If you have the mentality that you have to stagger to deal damage and after stagger you immediately go into commando, you get a less damaging stagger than you would if you exploited elemental weaknesses. We get a Tungsten Bangle, which we saw in the shop. It regains 150 HP. And we get Creature Comforts, which is a shop. And the Crystarium Expands. Operation Nora, stage one complete. You did well. So, that's our Aster Protoflorian entry. I'm going to go ahead and unequip Lightning and Hope. You might guess why I'm doing that. Let's take a look at Creature Comforts. If it bleeds, you can kill it. If you can kill it, we most likely carry it. Freshly harvested scientific specimens, bush meat, and organic materials. When you can't wait for nature to take its course, set course for creature comforts. It sells organic components. Which, as you can expect, helps tremendously with the ability to upgrade. Organic components were the ones that give you bonus points that allows for a multiplier to apply to component upgrades. Once you have the highest multiplier, which is X3, you can then proceed to use mechanical components, which provide a hefty amount of experience, but take away from bonus multipliers. But with the X3, you can throw in a bunch of mechanical components at once, and therefore can really ramp up the experience on whatever piece of equipment you're looking to upgrade. Creature Comforts only gets released once you beat Aster Protoflorian. Before this point, in order to get organic components, you need to farm them off of creatures. Thankfully, in Chapter 5, most of these enemies have dropped organics. So if we take a look at our list here, we have a hefty amount of organic components, thanks to fighting all those guys we fought along the way. We didn't get as many mechanicals. The ones we have here are sort of just leftovers from the previous chapter but we do have a bunch of organics. Um, as the result of fighting. Now, currently in Lenora's Garage, the most effective, or I should just outright say best, component that you can purchase is the Polymer Emulsion. The remaining ones do not give you as much experience per unit of gill. The Polymer Emulsion does cost cheap, cheapest. These three probably give you more experience individually than the Polymer Emulsion, but you get more experience per gill with the Polymer Emulsion than the other three. So if you're going to purchase from these four, you would want to purchase the Polymer Emulsion. Creature Comforts gives you five components that all give the same price. The one that actually gives you the most bonus points is the Sturdy Bone. If you're going to purchase any of these, you want to purchase Sturdy Bones. Now, it doesn't, ma it doesn't matter which component you actually use, per se. Um, it's not like Sturdy Bones are most effective on swords, whereas Enigmatic Fluid is most effective on guns. Um, so, components on hand 
especially with organics, can just be used as is if the goal is to get to x3 multiplier. But to get to x3 multiplier cheapest is to use 30 bones. This will always be true. 30 bones will always be the most effective. They do get tied with two other components. One of them is a barbed tail, and the other is the vibrant ooze. Sturdy Bone, Barbed Tail, and Vibrant Ooze, for all intents and purposes, are equal. So you can replace any instance of the word Sturdy Bone with Barbed Tail, and you won't have any change in upgrade efficiency. Um, however, the most effective mechanical component changes over the course of the game. The ones that you can purchase from the shops do get progressively better. Polymer Emulsion is currently the best, but by far it is one of the worst components to use. In Chapter 7, spoilers, you'll be able to purchase Turbo Jets. We have one on hand. But in Chapter 7 you can purchase Turbo Jets, and those will be the most effective at the time. Those will eventually get eclipsed later on. Using mechanical components on hand is a little bit trickier than using organics on hand. At least with organics, you know that you want to stop when you get to X3. But with mechanicals, if you use up all three fiber optic cables, then you, lo you lose bonus points that you then have to restore with organics. At what point is the trade-off of using these extra components not benefited by um, the gains from the organics. It's a bit tricky. If you're looking for like things that you want to sell, organics for the most part you do want to hold on to. They are useful even if you can purchase 30 bones, barbed tails, and vibrant oozes. Um, however, if an if an if an organic component sells for more than 420 gil, it is better to be sold and to use the gil to purchase 30 bones than it would be to use the organic component directly. So all of these organics that are on hand sell for either 40 gil or 15 gil. It is better to hold on to them and use them for bonus points than it would be to sell them and purchase 30 bones with you actually lose gill that way. Mechanical components, it's a bit of a different story. Um, the threshold is still 420 gill, and we actually have components that are equal to 420 gill. If the component sells for less than 420 gill, it would be more gill effective to sell it but only if you're going to use the money to purchase the most effective mechanical component. So for instance, it would be more gill effective to sell this electrolytic capacitors, these spark plugs, these bomb ashes, these bomb fragments, these digital circuits, this ceramic armor, and this paraffin oil. That leaves me with these three components left that are equal to 420 gil. Anything that's over 420 gil, you definitely want to hold on to and use because it will give better experience than selling it and purchasing the most effective uh, mechanical component would give. Anything that's equal to 420 gil is actually a touch and go. Sometimes it's better to sell, sometimes it's better to use. Now, I said it's better to sell and purchase the most effective one that's not actually polymer emulsion. What I just did is pretty terrible if the goal is to save gill, because purchasing polymer emulsions with the gill I just got would actually give me less experience for my money. But on the other hand, it does save me from having to use up whatever's on hand and then throw in, uh, throw in organics to get back to X3 and then throw in whatever's left, and then go back to the X3. Now, of these, I will certainly at least hold on to the Turbojet, because Turbojet does become the most effective component later on. 
I think I said chapter seven. So yeah, in chapter seven, turbo jets are available to buy in the shop and those are most effective anyway. So if I'm going to upgrade with the turbo jet later, it's better to hold on to it now because it sells for 420 gil, but you purchase it for 840 gil. So why would I sell it just to buy it back? Fiber optic cables and passive detectors never become the best. So it might be better to sell these, but since I don't really have any reason to purchase or upgrade right now. I'm just going to hold off on that. I just wanted to discuss um, the philosophy of selling components. All of these organics I'm holding on to and I will use um, because bonus points are very important and selling these to purchase 30 bones loses me gill. Mechanicals, if they sell for less than 420 gil, you want to hold on to, or the you want to sell. I said that backwards. If they sell for less than 420, you want to sell. If they equal 420, it's touch and go. If it's more than 420, hold on to and you use directly. It's actually interesting how 420 gil is the threshold in either direction. For organics, sell if it's more than 420 gil. If it's mechanical, sell for less than 420 gil. Notice I've not discussed selling accessories yet. Even these ones that I've said are probably not worth using, I'm holding on to. If I get a duplicate metal armband, however, I will probably sell it because we can purchase duplicates of these later. Actually, I think we can already purchase one now. Yeah, so like you might think I could sell it and then if I later need it, I can buy it. But I'm going to hold on to it because there is an achievement in this game related to having each accessory and each weapon. And I want to make sure that if I need its upgraded version, I will have it on hand as opposed to having to purchase it later. Nonetheless, I will never sell these because elemental resistance accessories can never be purchased. And if you sell all that you have, you can potentially lock yourself out of getting getting that achievement. The iron bangles, however, since we do have two silver bangles and a tungsten bangle, they're probably worth selling. I will, again, hold off on that until I have a reason to do so. But 250 gil isn't something to sniff at. It's a good amount, especially when you can get three 250s. All right, my rambling's over. in when we get there no we're the sea now and no one's there but my dad hope you need to let him know what happened Okay, time to hunt some Lassie. So what, we find him and that's that? Don't get all hot and bothered. Sarah, am I doing the right thing?
went to the Foul Sea hoping to help her. But I was too late. I knew you were hard-headed, but... That was... Oh. Ow! Snap to it! We're rolling out! Yeah, yeah. Hunting the sea, right? This is our chance! Do not let the sea escape! Move out! I will keep my promise, Lightning. And that ends chapter five. So there are 13 chapters in this game. We have gotten through five of them, which means there are eight left. What future things can happen, who knows? I'll see you next time.